Welcome back, champions, to the tier extravaganza of breaking down the champions of a specific seat in Idle Champions, so you know why I'm placing them in their respective rankings in a tier list. Today we're ripping open seat 8 like my new brand of gamer diapers. So, uh, let's get into it. Seat 8 is kind of a complete smorgasbord as far as what to expect from the champion sitting here. Some DPS, some support, some tanks, some speed. All it lacks is a little bit of healing. For those who are new around here, we start with the core champion of the seat and then work our way down alphabetically. That means this time we're starting with Delina. Delina? Delina. The chaotic good elf sorcerer. She serves exclusively as DPS, which fluctuates with Surge of Power, where she increases her damage each time she attacks, to a maximum of 10 stacks. Once reaching 10, she maintains that for 10 seconds then drops down to no stacks and cycles building up to reach the maximum power before falling back off. She later gains Empowered Spell, where she has a chance to inflict enemies with a damage over time effect for increased damage over 6 seconds. Also, she enhances her magical attacks with Spell Bombardment, where the further back in your formation she is, the more damage she deals. So ideally, you'll want her in the farthest back column in your formation if possible. She has a 50% chance to copy her attack on another target with her twinned spell. The choice in her specializations is simply between buffing her empowered spell or surge of power, and her ultimate lasts for 15 seconds, and makes her attack faster while maintaining her surge of power without it resetting for the duration. Delina is also tied to the Heroes of Baldur's Gate, which is a bit of a clunky affiliation. But in this case, it means some minor synergy with Cridal in Seat 2, and Vaconia in Seed 5. For Cridal, she gains the quadruple benefit of From the Shadows, which requires her to be placed in the back two columns, which she should be anyway because of her spell bombardment. And she has a high enough charisma to also benefit from his wild cards. For Vaconia, she naturally gains Cleric of Shar, being from the affiliation, where it usually requires a champion to be evil. She's a bit of a meme in the community, and she's not amazing by any stretch but she can outperform other DPS. Is that only because there are a lot of pretty subpar DPS in the game? Sure. Could she use some love? Certainly. I think she hovers between the high D and low C, and I'm actually going to put her in low C. But we're talking low C. I know a lot of people question my placement of some DPS champions, but you have to understand it. Just because you're not at the top doesn't instantly put you all the way down into F tier. Now, granted, spoilers, there are some straight up F tier DPS coming up soon, but the goal of my tier list is to look at the game as a whole and what a champion can offer to that. Delina, while hopefully and probably never your focus, might pop up in a harsh restriction, where she might actually be your best performing DPS. On the other hand, some DPS out there, you'll literally be better off using a support as your damage dealer. Anyway, let's mosey on over to Beetle and Grim. That's right, two champions in one. Between the two of them, they cover the roles of support, DPS, and gold find. A very important mechanic to know with them is that if one of them meets the requirement of something, they both do. With Beetle being a true neutral dwarf rogue slash wizard, and Grim being a chaotic good human barbarian, each with varied ability scores. Together they qualify for damn near everything. Very early on, they get their ultimate, tag team. When used, they swap places with each other in their slot, changing which buffs they offer to your formation, but each with the same name. For example, Get Buff, where Beetle increases the damage of champions within two slots of him by a decent amount, whereas Grim's Get Buff increases his damage for each barbarian in the formation, stacking multiplicatively to the post stack, and as Grim is himself a barbarian, he counts for one. Really, there are only other three barbarians in the game that can effectively increase this between Pwent in Seed 5, Ayla in Seed 9, and Yorvin in Seed 10. There are other barbarians, but they either don't synergize with Grim or are DPS themselves, and one of them even shares a seat with these two, so we'll be talking about them soon, but obviously can't be used together. Then they also get Special Order, which for each of them serves as a sticky debuff. For Beetle, it equates to a debuff that increases the amount of gold an enemy will drop when slain, so it makes him important for an Azaka farm. The enemy has to be damaged to a very small threshold to even receive the debuff, 
Just be sure you look for this icon to assure you've applied it before swapping him out. For Grim, Special Order serves as a debuff that increases the damage enemies he hits takes from all sources, stacking up to 10 times additively. This makes him a useful tool for click debuff formations, especially considering he's chaotic for freely, or just a debuff in general for your DPS since it's sticky. On top of all this utility, they also get Long Rest, which is tied to swapping them via their ultimate. The champion who is not present will gain one stack every 10 seconds they are not in your formation, and the active champion will lose one stack for every 10 seconds they are in your formation. For each stack, Beetle's Git buff and Grim's Special Order are increased by a large amount. You can use this a couple of ways. Uh, for example, putting a familiar on their ult, which by the way, its duration does not get reduced by their gear, so you're stuck at 5 minutes. And that way it just keeps the cycle flowing. Or pull them for a very large burst. For example, keeping Grim in for a long time and letting Beetle stack up. So you can swap him in for a hardy buff to potentially push past a difficult wall or something you're just barely otherwise not able to push past. They each get a specialization to choose from. For Beetle, your choice is between increasing his git buff for each champion in your formation with a dexterity score of 17 or higher, which stacks multiplicatively and then is applied to git buff multiplicatively, or the same thing but instead using a 16 or higher for intelligence. So just pick whichever is more prevalent for your formation. For Grim, he chooses between increasing the potency of his debuff by 100%, or making his special order also scale with strength 18 plus champions, not just barbarians. Though someone like Ayla who is strength 18 and a barbarian will still only count as one. So the choice here depends upon if you're using him for his debuffs or you're using him as your primary DPS. Honestly though, at the end of the day, you'll likely almost always be taking the first choice, the debuff increase. Overall, they are an amazing tool to have in your arsenal. They cover so much ground between being great for Azaka farming, a click debuff formation, and just their great availability. Their numbers for everything aren't anything super crazy, and that is kind of their main downside, but I think they're a solid a champion. Well, champions. Swaggering on in now is Corazon, the chaotic neutral human rogue. He serves exclusively as support, but also comes equipped with one of the best armor-breaking ultimates in the game. His support comes in the form of Pirate's Code, where he increases the damage of all neutral along the good and evil axis for an alright amount, but is further increased later by his Goat Pirate, where each time he attacks, he stacks a 2% bonus to Pirate's Code additively. Really, at the end of the day, this just makes it comparable to most average support buffs. And not only does it never excel, this is the only damage buffing formation ability he offers. He does, however, also get Grease, where when he attacks with his primary attack, which hits a random enemy, he drops a grease puddle that slows enemies walking through it. He drops an amount equal to the number of neutral champions in the formation. To make up for all this neutral nonsense, he also gets honorary crewmates, where he allows champions adjacent to him to count as neutral on top of their native alignment, specifically for formation abilities. We've talked about this before in the past as this will also affect other formation abilities from the likes of Merowyn or Viconia that would otherwise never affect a good champion. His specializations are a choice between having honorary crewmates instead affect every champion not adjacent to him, or making his grease puddles always form under the furthest enemy, not specifically the one he attacks. And keep in mind the slow does stack multiplicatively if the pools are overlapping. Now his ultimate is the most important tool in his small arsenal. It's basically a Jarlaxle ult, but on fire. Not only do flaming cannonballs rain from the sky, but they also ignite any grease puddles on the ground, making enemies caught in the flames take bud damage over time, as well as 100% more damage if caught in the flaming puddle. This will absolutely shred through armor, and even beyond that. Oftentimes, when you're left with that last enemy on screen, you just can't quite kill. You might whip out Jim as we covered in the last video, but Corazon's ult has a high chance of just wiping them out as well. While his neutral shifting and ultimate are interesting tools, his numbers just don't keep up. I swear it's like they forgot to add a debuff to his grease, or another scaling to Pirate's Code. Like a multiplicative bonus to Pirate's Code for every active grease, or, or at least scaling it up for every active member from his affiliation of the Ox Venturers Guild. Just something. 
Though, do remember, Merylwen's ultimate interacts with everyone from their affiliation. And during her ultimate, those affected by his grease, within the range of her ult, do take 200% more damage. But overall, his numbers are subpar enough you probably won't use him actively in your formation. The only time you might is if you are severely restricted in your choices in a variant, or you absolutely want a neutral mechanic for an otherwise not neutral DPS, or to swap him in for a timely ult. I'd say he steps into a low C, but like Delina, that's a low C. He at least has utility that might see the light of day. Next up is Human. Human. Uh, the totally not three kobolds pretending to be a human. Okay, well, actually, they are three kobolds. Zrang, Klebe, and Yasa. Collectively, the lawful evil, kobold slash human, yes, they do count as human as well, rogue slash bard. They serve as speed and support, with a very important focus on speed. Unlike the multi-champion champion Beetle and Grim, Human's formation abilities change based on their position in the formation. Front, middle, and back. And these definitions change depending on how many columns the campaign's formation has. For three columns, pretty easy to guess where the front, middle, and back would be. For four, four, four. For four columns, there is only one front and back, with two middle. For five columns, there are two in the front, two in the back, with one in the middle. And six, two, two, and two, front, back, and middle. Keep this in mind as every one of their formation abilities drastically change based on which column they're slotted in. Starting off with our formation ability, Teamwork. When Human is in the front, Zrang hops on the top and activates their speed mechanic, where enemies have a chance to drop double quest rewards or count for double quest progress. This is specifically increased by a passive he later gets called Carefully Balanced, where it is increased for each adjacent champion to Human, which also has a geared slot tied to it so you can scale it up. So for this, you want them slotted in the front and adjacent to as many champions as possible. And since Human is not a tank, ideally you would want them in the second slot of the front, but some formations do only have one front column, so be careful. And know this can go well over 100%, and you want it to. Since not only does it become a guarantee, but it keeps spilling over. With enough investment, you can make a single kill count for multiple. Then ideally pair them with the likes of Sentry and Nahara to reduce the requirements, Shandy to make everything move faster, Whittle to make things spawn faster, and just zoom along the way once you have a fully invested speed team to your wall. Do note getting this all rolling takes a long time. The next section of teamwork is Klebe, which activates when Human is in the middle. This will increase your formation's damage against specifically boss enemies. And if the boss has hit-based or armor-based health, you will destroy twice as many chunks as you normally would. The raw numbers of this are increased by the formation ability Klebe shares with Yasa, who we'll get to in a second, called Hello Fellow Humans, where depending on how many other humans are active in your formation, the damage buff of Klebe's teamwork will be increased. It is incredibly important to have at least one human, as this buff will be abysmally low otherwise. Then when in the back of your formation, Yasa takes over. She increases the damage of champions two columns in front of Human by a pretty standard supporting buff amount. This is also increased by Hello Fellow Humans, and follows the same rule of you better have at least one or that number is going to be flushable down the toilet. And for both Klebe and Yasa, clearly you want to scale that number as high as you can. But maybe you don't have a lot of humans, or you realize that a lot of the humans we have access to aren't the greatest buffers. That's where Human's specialization choice comes in. You have a choice between either changing Hello Fellow Humans to the most populated race in your formation. So, for example, a fun one to pair with this is Farida, as you'll probably have a lot of tieflings slotted. And then since they are the most popular, they will be chosen as how to scale Yasa and Kaleeb's damage buff. And yes, Mahen's feat counts for this as well. However, Human's other specialization choice flat increases teamwork by 100% which helps both their speed mechanic and will increase their damage buffing potential, as long as you're okay with sticking with humans. Now they also get Please Stand By, where each of the non-active kobolds offer a small passive bonus while the other is on top. As long as Zrang is not the active kobold, he makes boss enemies move 25% slower. As long as Klebe is not the active kobold, he causes hit-based enemies to have a 50% chance of spawning with 25% of their health already gone. 
And if Yasa is not the active Cobalt, she reduces the base attack cooldown of champions adjacent to Human. Their ultimate launches multiple projectiles from their crossbow, and grants a buff depending on the active Cobalt. Zerang doubles his teamwork for 30 seconds. Very nice for moving forward quickly. Klebe stuns all non-boss enemies and prevents other enemies from spawning for 15 seconds. And Yasa reduces any active ultimate cooldown of all champions in your formation by 25%. Overall, Human offers a lot to your game. As they're viable for every patron, though one will require a feat, their raw damage buffing numbers aren't amazing, so you probably won't be using them unless you're otherwise restricted or need a filler. But you'll always use them for their speed mechanic to push to your wall faster or for farming. I'm going to put them in a solid A. <laughs> Human is S tier, you grotesque, mephitic, imbecilic troglodyte. Taking another notch in the belt of the Evergreen Champions, we've got Hitch. Really though, I kind of think of him as more like another core champion, as all you need to do to unlock him is sign up for their newsletter. You don't need any kind of in-game progressional achievement, and if you haven't done it yet, do it now. Once you do, you'll have this chaotic good human rogue added to your roster. He's a simple and effective support, but also restrictive. Through his natural performer, he offers a fairly good damage buff but only for those with a charisma of 14 or higher. Tied to his primary attack, where he throws daggers before making a melee attack, he gets Ricochet, which gives a chance for the thrown daggers to ricochet to another enemy up to five times. Each ricochet increases the effect of Natural Performer. With even just one stack, this boosts Natural Performer to a hearty buff. His specialization choices are between giving his base attack one additional dagger to throw, or flat increasing natural performer by 100%. Generally speaking, you'll want to take the second. Only in scenarios where you are constantly able to mass throw daggers for maximum ricochet could the first pay off. And even then, it would be roughly comparable to the always stable 100%. His ultimate makes him disappear and reappear, backstabbing the furthest enemy from your formation five times. He's easy to place in your formation, and almost always worth it if your DPS has that charisma check. Unfortunately, three of the top four DPS don't have a place for him, but he does fit well with Ashara. With Artemis and Krond, he doesn't match their ideal requirements, and Zorbu just doesn't have the charisma. Still, his buffing is good, and enough in my opinion to get him into the bottom of B. Now we finally have our golden boy we've mentioned in just about every episode, and to the Rack. Nrak is a lawful neutral Githserai monk. He serves primarily as a DPS but also as a support. And if you've watched my videos up to this point, you know exactly how that support functions. But let's get to it. He gets Gitsurai Focus, where he increases the potency of formation abilities of those adjacent to him, as long as they have a wisdom of 14 or higher. A couple of things to note about this, both positive and negative. First, the negative. There is no way to scale this bonus. What you get is what you get. No feet, no gear, nothing. The positive is, unlike most abilities of this nature, this isn't just for positional formation abilities. Which is why it's most common I bring him up for a gold find formation. Where he doesn't offer any gold boost himself, many gold finders have that wisdom requirement. So being adjacent to him will just hyper boost their own gold find. He's also involved in super boosting Orkira's elemental fire debuff. Go check out the seat 1 video if you want the info on that. While all of this is super useful, there is a problem with this guy. Everything else in his kit, and I mean everything, is DPS focused. So while interesting and fairly potent, that's his only support tool. So it's rare you will be using him as an actual support in a pushing formation. And while there are scenarios where you can make him perform as an alright DPS, he's never going to be the best. But let's quickly break down the rest of his kit. First, as a monk, he uses key points, which he gathers one every time he attacks. Each point will increase his damage and attack speed additively, stacking 8 times. However, he also eventually gets Stunning Strike, which he will consume 4 key points if available, to stun all of the enemies he hits for 2 seconds, while also dealing more damage with that attack. And then he also gets Deft Strike and Kensei Cleave, which rotate with his primary attack. Deft Strike is his second attack, which deals a large amount more damage and grants a key point and Kensei Cleave is his third attack, which deals AoE damage. His specialization choices are between granting him three key points if he hits multiple enemies with Kensei Cleave, 
or making Death Strike deal 100% more damage as well as granting a single key point. Generally speaking, his second pick is better if you're looking for flat more damage. But the first is useful for popping out more stunning strikes, since you probably aren't using him for damage anyway. His ultimate is a simple 30 second damage buff for himself. Even though we always talk about him, and I love him, because I'm weird and I like Githserai psionic monks, his wisdom buff is about the only useful tool he offers. If he ever gets tinkered with and leaned more into either damage or support, I think that would be great. Like maybe being able to scale Githserai focus for at least just himself to boost his damage. Or make Death Strike also boost the damage of adjacent champions, just something. But until then, I think he's a flat B, simply due to his wisdom buff, because without it, he'd basically be useless. But with it, he offers a lot to the game. Following Rack is Tatiana, the chaotic neutral Genasi? Genasi? Barbarian slash Druid. She serves as a tank, support, speed, and is our next Black Dice Society member. The BDS is a funny affiliation for me since they keep getting released right after I release a video and often share a seat with the video I just released. This was the case for Nahara and Valentine, and similarly with Veronica, but she didn't share the seat with the video I released, but anyway. So everyone knows I'll say it here, I intend to do a full, cohesive list of every single champion in the game after I'm finished with breaking down all of the seats. And that is where I will mention anyone I missed along the way. Then after that I will probably focus specifically on the new champions as they are released, and add them to the overall cohesive list, making any adjustments along the way. Anyway, let's get back to the topic at hand, Tatiana, whose entire kit revolves around her formation ability, Faithful Friend, where she picks a random slot in the formation from the middle columns, meaning singularly, not the front or back, in any formation. The champion who is placed in that chosen slot receives a rather decent damage buff, which is marked by this blue area under their feet. Keep in mind, this is completely random, and you have no way of controlling it. So it's worth starting the run and seeing where she's going to pick. So if it's a complete garbage slot, you can end it and restart, hopefully getting something better. However, her specialization choices can mitigate bad placement. The first also applies it to those adjacent to the slot, and increases the effect by 100%. The second applies it to all in the same column of the chosen slot, and increasing the effectiveness by 200%. And lastly, just increasing the effect by 400% for that singular randomly chosen slot. So yeah, ideally you'll want the DPS in that specific slot, and choose that third specialization. But honestly, if you can reach them with one of the other choices, you should probably just run with it. Two other of Tatiana's formation abilities are used to increase the effectiveness of Faithful Friend. And if you're going to get them all up and running, it's actually a fatty buff. First, she gets Rising Fury where each time she is attacked, she gains a Fury stack, increasing Faithful Friend additively for each stack. She'll lose 10% of her stacks for every 15 seconds she is not under attack, and this caps at 150 stacks. Second is Rage, where if she is at 50 stacks of Fury, and for every 15 seconds she remains at that 50 or above mark, she'll gain a Rage stack stacking up to six times and buffing Faithful Friend multiplicatively for each Rage stack. However, if she falls below 50 Fury, she will lose all of her Rage stacks. All of this together makes for a very nice buff. But there is kind of a problem. It requires her to be constantly under attack, and she's a tank, so it fits, but she has no unique form of damage negation like some other tanks. So comparatively, she's a bit squishy, but she is required to be taking damage to fully reach her buffing potential. But let's not forget she's also a speed champion, and that comes in the form of Find a Feast where if she hasn't been under attack for 15 seconds, and you're in a non-boss area, she'll sprint ahead and come back in a couple of seconds with some more enemies to slaughter. She has both feats and a gear slot tied to this, which will scale up how many enemies she brings back with her. It's passable, but really it's not the greatest form of a speed mechanic, and she shares a slot with Human, one of the best, so eh. Her ultimate summons a field of entangling roots in front of the formation, damaging enemies inside of it, while also reducing the damage they deal to your formation. I think she climbs to the high B, coming very close to breaching into A. If she just had some mechanic of damage negation or her speed mechanic was more useful, she'd probably get in there. But she is a great buffer for both being a tank and being in this seat. 
Oh, time to roll downhill in this seat as we move on to Vlanya, the neutral good Eladrin bard slash wizard. She focuses entirely on being a support by buffing everyone in front of her with enthralling performance, which is an additive buff via stacks between tempo, bass, and treble, which all combine to increase her overall performance, each with their own gear slot tied to it, and each having a cap of 300 stacks. With tempo, she gains 4 stacks anytime a champion other than her attacks. Base gains 20 stacks whenever a champion adjacent to Vlanya gets a kill. And treble gains 1 stack every time you collect a coin drop. All stacks are decreased by 10% every 7.5 seconds. This can reach decent heights, but nothing crazy. And you'll basically never have full capped stacks, except for when you use her ultimate, which brings her to full stacks for all three. But her ult is useful for something else, as she Thanos snaps up to 10 non-boss enemies out of existence. The problem is they don't count as kills, so really the only time you'll use it is on an actual boss encounter. But even then, if you're relying on something like Kroll's Traitor, for example, that will actually hinder you because you need that AoE splash. And it does not work like Jim's Chicken to progress, as if you warp out the last remaining enemy, it will just rinse the encounter and not progress you. So really, there isn't a lot of utility for it. Her specialization choice is between also applying enthralling performance to those in the same column as her, or increasing the effect of enthralling performance by 200% if the column she is in only contains herself or a maximum of one other champion. Ideally, you'd go for the second choice if your formation allows it. She's also a part of the newly formed Sirens of the Realms affiliation, which includes Brig, Arisha, and herself. For each of them slotted in your formation, her enthralling performance is increased by 200% multiplicatively. Because of fairly recent tweaks and the affiliation, I think she barely sneaks into a low C, previously being in the D range. And lastly, we have Walnut, the lawful neutral Wood Elf Druid. She serves as a tank and support, and most of her kit revolves around Documancer where she increases the damage of champions adjacent to her for each enemy killed in the current area, starting at zero and resetting to zero when you change areas. She also gets Jobs Done, where she increases the effect of Documancer for 30 seconds when either completing an area or entering an already completed area, and killing enemies within the completed area refreshes that 30 seconds. As a tank, when Walnut comes under attack, she activates Wolfnut, where she wild shapes into a wolf and gains a small, temporary hit point buff based on how many enemies are on screen. While wild shaped, she also gains Pen Paws, which stacks up to 50 and increases the effect of Documancer by a decent amount per stack, gaining one every two seconds she's in wolf form, but will decrease by one every four seconds while not in wolf form. She has two separate specialization choices. The first being between making Documancer apply to champions within two slots, not just adjacent, and increasing the effect by 100%, or applying it to all champions on the top and bottom of the formation and increasing it by 200%, or just applying it to everyone in your formation for no increase whatsoever. The second choice is between either buffing Documancer by 500% for each effect from one of the champions in her affiliation, between Cathris's Unseen Encouragement Donner's Lead by Example, and Rosie's Deflect Missile, or just increasing it by 100% for each champion not within her affiliation slotted in the formation. Her ultimate summon a bunch of critters to sprint across the screen, shredding enemies in their path, each enemy killed during which will heal your party by 10% of their maximum health. But if no enemies are killed, they will instead gain a temporary hit point shield equal to 100% of their maximum health. This works as a decent armor-breaking ultimate. Now, oh boy, I gotta say it, F tier. I know a lot of people out there are going to disagree with this rank, but man, Walnut really only serves one purpose. That is to go back to an area where you can clear enemies and farm up her Documancer to increase your bud. To then push forward and utilize that bud increase in some fashion through fire breath potions or ultimate scaling, which is clunky and annoying. And this is because her Documancer gives literally nothing at your wall. It is in my personal opinion that Documancer is the worst designed formation ability in this entire game. It doesn't carry over anything into a new area, and it requires kills to give any bonus at all, and is her only damage buffing formation ability. 
She offers you absolutely nothing in an area where you are struggling to get kills. I just cannot get behind a champion that doesn't give you anything when you need it the most. It is the peak of a false sense of security and is a new player trap. The only reason you'd ever choose her over another champion in a timegate, in my opinion, is if you are crazy desperate for tanks, or your other choice is a terrible DPS. If they just allowed her to carry over even a fraction, so Documancer isn't zero in a new area, she would spike up in the tears. But until that day comes, I am keeping her in F. And that's all I got for you today. Seed 8 is over. Leave a comment on what you think about these champions, why you hate my placement of the champions, and why I'm ugly. If you've made it this far, you might as well hit me up with that like, sub, and bell, because I'm always working on the next one. I'll hopefully see you then. Until next time, have a hell of a time out there, Pterodactyls. And by the way, Pterodactyls is like a play on my name and the fact we're doing tier lists. Get it? Like, Pterodactyls, 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 Pterodacty